Right, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Quentin Eichbaum. I'll be the moderator of the session today. I am the uh, chair of the Global Health Humanities Working Group at the Consortium of Universities for Global Health. And I'm a board member of the consortium and uh, I'm a professor at Vanderbilt University School of Medicine. And I always like to add that I was born and raised in Africa and so I'm very pleased to be have a speaker today from my uh, home continent. Um, so um, people will trickle in uh, as we get going, but I, I like to start things as much as possible on time. And um, I will take us through the session. We have a little bit of flexibility here. Um, and I'm gonna show you the program quickly. Uh, we're going to start off, I'll just take you through the logistics. We're starting off with the keynote speaker, whom I'll introduce in a minute, Dr. Uh, Patrick Kabanda from Uganda. We'll talk for about 30 minutes. Then we'll have a, a Q&A session of about 30 minutes. There's some flexibility there. And we should be about halfway through at that point. And then we're going to go into the breakout rooms. Um, and Revathi Ravi will uh, introduce the topics of the four breakout rooms. And we hope we get an even distribution of people in those rooms. And each of them will be facilitated by one or, or two people, uh, whoever's around. And uh, so the breakouts are basically, one is on indigenous knowledge or other ways of knowing. The second one is on historical anthropologic perspectives. How did we get here? The third one is, uh, what do we mean by decolonization? This is about definitions and epistemic issues in decolonization. And the fourth one is decolonizing the mind, uh, based on the title of the book, well-known book by Ngugi Wationga, Cognitive versus Structural Decolonization. And that'll be about an hour, so we've got a lot of time for discussion. It may seem a long time, but we always run out of time with these discussions anyway. Um, then we'll open it up, everyone comes back, and we have an open discussion, and then we plot a path forward after that, um, what we want to do. Uh, and let me also add that this uh, organization of the satellite came from three different directions, both from the Global Health Humanities Working Group and from the, the Board of Directors, Decolonization Subcommittee, and uh, couple of subcommittees that have been convened uh, some months ago, and then from uh, another group of people who are very interested in the topic. As you all know, it's a topic of enormous interest currently. Uh, there are a lot of uh, debates about how it can be done, whether the wording is right. So it's very, very controversial, and you'll notice quite a few uh, uh, topics <coughs> under this title at the conference. So I'm going to start off after that. And um, I'd like to ask you as Patrick speaks, put questions in the chat, but, um, and we'll monitor those, but also, and you may much prefer that, um, we can, because this is Zoom, you can talk either without video, your video on or with your video on, whichever suits you better. Maybe easier for you to do the questions directly through voice, but if you prefer, just put them in the chat and we'll try to monitor from there as well. So it gives me a lot of pleasure to be able to introduce our keynote speaker today, uh, Patrick Kabanda, um, who is um, someone I uh, actually only came to meet more recently. And uh, I'm very impressed with uh, Patrick's trajectory of his life and he's an ideal speaker for us um, and I immediately went and bought Patrick's book which I pre you probably can't see seeing I've got a virtual screen behind me but it's The Creative Wealth of Nations and that book got very well reviewed on um, Amazon so maybe I should wait for a few minutes while you all order your copy on Amazon first and <laughs> um, but it, uh, the foreword is in fact written by um, Amartya Sen, Nobel laureate in, um, in economics. And uh, so it's, it's well worth reading. I've only started reading it from Cambridge University Press. So Patrick is a very interesting person. He was born in Uganda and he studied at the Juilliard School of Music um, uh, as an organist and 
uh, all the other components that that takes to graduate from the Juilliard School of Music. And he's also a graduate of the Fletcher International uh, uh, Affairs School in Boston at Tufts University. He received the Juilliard School's William Schumann Prize for Outstanding Achievement and Leadership in Music in 2003. From 2012 to 2013, he was a Charles Francis Adams Scholar at the Fletcher School in, in Boston. And besides concerting and lecturing worldwide, he has taught at Phillips Academy, which is one of the uh, top schools in, in, in uh, the Northeast. Um, shouldn't Phillips Academy be decolonized? <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 Um, it be called the African Academy. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> um, uh, and he consulted for the World Bank, uh, where he worked actually with a teacher of mine from Harvard Medical School, Dr. Jim Kim. We chatted about that a little bit yesterday. And, and in the office of the senior vice president and chief economist, and he contributed to the World Development Report in 2016 and the UNDP of 2015 and 2019 Human Development Report. In 2013, he was awarded the Presidential Award for Citizenship and Public Service from Tufts University in Massachusetts University. So Patrick has a superb background in the arts and a, a deep understanding of, of international affairs and also having worked at, at the World Bank. So uh, I'm really pleased to have someone of, of his uh, background in, in the arts and, and humanities. And we had a really interesting talk yesterday as well about many components in the arts and humanities. So I, I'm thrilled to have you, Patrick, and um, I'm also glad you could do this at, at relatively short notice. So. Maybe you want to give us an organ recital first, Patrick. Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> okay. yes. All right. Well, thank you so much. I'm going to leave it to you um, to, to, to take over. I think you wanted to start off with some reading or something first. Yes, yes. And by the way, um, I, I put up the program in, in the chat because we had some difficulty uploading it. If you want to get back, if you want to refer to it. Um, but uh, over to you, Patrick. Yes, uh, first of all, uh, thank you so much, uh, Quentin, for that kind introduction. And um, I also would like to thank many people who are working with you because I know it's not easy to put these things together. And also, um, I want to thank my friend Richard Wamai, I think he's on already, has logged on, um, who is, I think, right now in Nairobi, in Kenya. And uh, Richard and I met in Boston many, many years ago. I think it's over a decade now. And um, it's a pleasure to reconnect, and I was so delighted to invite me um, to be part of this uh, event. Now, I'm not um, someone who studied, uh, who studied um, global health or not even a doctor as an artist, but I can tell you from my own life experience, music is like medicine <laughs> to me. And I am going to talk about those issues a little later. And uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about, which we are going to, I think, discuss later on um, with Quinton and others in the group which we'll have, is the meaning of the word decolonization itself. Because I think, as Quinton told me yesterday, the word itself is becoming like a, a, a buzzword. And global health is unequivocal. We know, I think, all of us what it means, but then decolonization can take different turns. But if there was colonization, and it was intense, and uh, also I think decolonization will also bring in questions so we need to ask. But since we are talking about um, the arts and culture and the humanities, I really believe we cannot begin to start talking about global um, health and decolonizing global health without really going back to the foundation. And for me, that foundation is the African curriculum. You know, I believe that our education system is really not really receptive to the ideas of the arts and humanities. It's all about science, 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 and there's nothing wrong with uh, STEM subjects, uh, which is uh, science, technology, engineering, and math. But as Quinton yesterday um, really put it, it's impossible to have just, it's almost we have a kind, we have only three wheels working, one of them is not working, or some other wheels are not working. And I think the arts need to be part of this agenda. 
and if we really want to uh, drive what we are going forward with uh, we really need to make sure that we do have um, the ads um, basically really reflected in what we are trying to talk about especially in the African curriculum now uh, my talk is going to go um, in two um, three parts okay to be divided into three parts in the first part I'm going to talk about the arts as a form of innovation and um, I'm going to use an example um, of a professor from Stanford to try to show how the arts can actually be part of an innovation system and help us, helping us to innovate new ways how to deliver global health. And the second part uh, will be uh, how the arts can actually be conduits and I think this is very well known from soap operas to music and many many other areas how the arts can help us send the message out and I believe that you know you can have all the statistics you can have and you can have all the science but if you can't connect to people as we are really seeing here in this COVID situation where some people just refuse um, to uh, take vaccines because they are they don't have the trust or they are afraid of for whatever reason so that means that the data by itself cannot really help us if we can't really emotionally connect uh, with people and the arts can really quite be wonderful in helping us reach there and then the uh, third part will be how the arts themselves uh, like the material of mental health <laughs> or health um, and I think that that's an area which should also be taken now more seriously partly because the arts um, can help us be aware of our surroundings especially in this age of COVID right now mental health I think is going to be another another big issue which we really need to uh, be paying attention to and I believe that if we don't pay attention to mental health we are going to lose out and if you think that the world doesn't have enough doctors in the real world what about psychiatrists we don't have enough and I think in places like Africa this is something we really need because we have the arts as part of our lives but to start off with the very first part of innovation I want to read this excerpt actually Quinton I'm going to share the screen and Quinton please um, would you uh, read that excerpt for us and it's um, um, uh, this um, gentleman was talking about Thomas uh, okay. Sadoff um, who won the Nobel Prize in Medicine in okay. 2020 and this is an excerpt from his lecture. Okay. Uh, I think it's excerpt on bassoon influence. Yes. Ex I had been interested in many different subjects in high school. In fact, all subjects except for sports, which I found primitive. Now, ironic to me, as I have become addicted to regular exercise. Early on, I became fascinated by classical music. After unsuccessful attempts at playing the violin, I gave this instrument up to the delight of everyone around me who had to listen to me trying. However, I then decided to learn to play bassoon, which I pursued with a vengeance motivated by a wonderful teacher, Herbert Tauscher, who was the solo bassoonist at the local opera house and who probably taught me more about life than most of my other teachers. I credit my musical education with my dual appreciation for discipline and hard work on the one hand and for creativity on the other. I think trying to be marginally successful in learning how to be a musician taught me how to be a scientist. There's no creativity if one does not master the subject and pay exquisite attention to the details. But there's also no creativity if one cannot transcend the details and a common interpretation of such details and use one's mastery of the subject like an instrument to develop new ideas. Thomas Sudov, Professor Stanford School of Medicine, biochemist known for the study of synaptic transmission. Yes, sir. Thank you, Quinton. So we can replace the words violin there with like African tube fiddle and maybe bassoon, <laughs> the African float. Yeah. and classical music with African music 
and we will probably arrive at the same conclusion because me myself I have seen the same process in the work I do my book some of the examples I share show how the arts really can emancipate our imagination and one of the things I recently said is that given that we now don't have perfect information um, and that we are trying to really navigate and a uh, world as places which we have not been going especially with COVID and medicine we really need minds which can be flexible and creative and it cannot be a standard framework as many of us uh, grew up with now one thing I'll tell you is that when you're talking of decolonizing our minds one of the things I wanted to actually play this except I believe we all came from Africa <laughs> and <laughs> I think uh, this gentleman, uh, Mr. Sudov, I think his great, great, great ancestors all came from Africa anyway. But what has happened is that, at least when I was in school, you will be beaten to speak Swahili on campus. You will be beaten to speak Luganda on campus. You have to speak English, okay? Uh, because that was um, the system which, you know, was thought that we should be learning from or learning in to try to prepare us for jobs but what i'll tell you i think really has been now being investigated the education system we've been which was exported to africa which was which we are normally following i think has to do with trying to prepare us to become civil servants or even we can even become medical doctors of some sort um but it's nothing to do with like how can i be creative and think outside the box. Now what if uh, Mr. Sudov was some student in Kenya who was beaten uh, for speaking his language or playing uh, the African tube, uh, tube fiddle or African flute because this is not going to take this person somewhere. We probably will not have his work. And I think this connection has to be made um, how we can really make sure that to try to promote the Africa um, we want or Africa we need in terms of um, seeing how issues like global health can go forward in the perspective of Africa, we cannot eliminate the arts because they are really part of our culture and part of our own healing. And I think uh, what we can draw from such examples um, of this gentleman who won a Nobel Prize is indeed that we have the arts even in our own way. We don't have anything to lose other than really uh, go forward and finding uh, new ways we can promote African ideas on the global stage and inviting in even new ideas. Now, the second um, thing I need to also talk about uh, here, my second point is how the arts themselves can be uh, conduits of um, promoting information, uh, health information. So when I was growing up in the 1980s, and I do note this in the book, um, HIV AIDS was a big, big problem. But um, I, had, I had mentioned to um, uh, Quinton yesterday in our chat, people would not believe that HIV was real for the most part because they thought maybe it was voodoo. And it was difficult to take this seriously. In fact, some of you may remember there was a, a lady, um, older lady somewhere, I think it was Western Uganda, maybe Massacre, someplace around there, uh, where she would even sell soil because she said she had a vision of something that this kind of soil will um, um, help people get rid of HIV. And people drove there <laughs> in droves to try to get this soil to be cured of HIV. So there was a lot of superstition around superstitions around HIV. So I'll tell you one person who I believe was quite powerful was actually a Ugandan singer called Phil Retire. Some of you may know about Phil Retire from his music, um, but Phil Retire was based in Sweden and he came to Uganda. Um, to sing. So one of the things he took on was to sing a message about HIV. And I remember uh, some of our concerts were held at my cathedral where I grew up at Namim Cathedral, which is a place which can easily sit 3,000 people, I think. And these concerts were always packed. And what was incredible about Phil Retire's performance is he, he was, used to work with local choirs. In fact, I think one of them um, uh, schools he worked with was Gaiaza High School. Some of you may know about the schools, like one of Philips Academy kind of schools in Uganda. These girls will come to sing or feel a retire in his songs. And me, some of my contemporaries played uh, keyboards for accompanying him. 
So in a way, um, filial retire was more effective to, in trying to promote the message of HIV, which was definitely, and even maybe still to a certain extent, a global health issue. But the difference was not speak, uh, singing an um, concept which would be so foreign to us. He was, he was from our clan, he was from our tribe, he was from our country, and he was from Africa. And the message he was singing in local language almost was like sort of a national anthem to us, a lot of people. And the message could go down because this is someone who looks like you who is singing this. And another interesting part, which is unfortunate, is uh, Philip Tri himself contracted HIV. So, and that was really difficult. And I remember some people were saying, oh, I think he just wants to make money until he actually really died. But Philip Tri, um someone who many of us will never forget, not just because he was just a remarkable artist, but because he was able to connect his talent and his music to try to promote the message of HIV. I'll tell you there are many, many young people, friends of mine, who never um, even made it to 20 years of old, or some of them who lost their parents, and um, uh, siblings, um, relatives, partly because of HIV, um, and the way it was really working through our country and Africa in general. But I think that this is another thing where the arts can be very powerful. And I know, I think in terms of soap operas, this has been documented in parts of West Africa quite heavily. And I think maybe some in South Africa, some of these concepts are really quite well understood. Um, but then another part I want to talk about, um, and which will be my last part to discuss here, is how the arts themselves <coughs> can be um, health in terms of mental health and this is I talk about this in my book I think in chapter 8 where um, I believe and this is not me just believing I think it's true that you cannot have health without wealth and I think as uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson said that the first wealth is health okay we really cannot do much without being healthy and if anything this COVID-19 situation has shown us that now, going in, putting in a little bit of economics and context here, some of you may know, for example, um, a few weeks ago, um, it was said that the American economy was growing so fast. I think it's, it's the best it's grown in the last 40 years. And of course, there's inflation. But as you know, politicians, this is very good news to try to say, look at how the economy is growing on such an impressive pace and we have to be thankful for many people who still can have their jobs and for people to still make a living uh, when the economy is doing well but we have to also acknowledge that it's not enough are we going to say that we are satisfied because the economy has grown so fast <laughs> okay we have inflation but at least the economy is growing when it, covid is still really making life miserable all of us can already be, be comfortable to do the things which we used to do when we did not have COVID. So I think that by putting um, health first, we can really achieve a lot of things uh, in terms of even um, economic well-being and other aspects of well-being. And Quinton, I'm going to share another part where, another screen where I would like you to also read an excerpt. And this is in connection to the African arts and healing. <clears throat> art and healing in Africa. How do, how do artworks and objects become powerful and effective for use in healing? Over a long period of time in Africa, as in other parts of the world, people have made and used objects to facilitate healing, good faith and well-being. The global COVID-19 pandemic is prompting change and reflection on many aspects of our daily lives, including the role of the arts to foster healing and grapple with obstacles, moments of transition and uncertainty. At the Eskenazi Museum of Art, connections between art and healing are also explored in our art therapy and arts-based wellness program. Artistic practices associated with healing in Africa draw upon a large range of objects, including amulets, staffs, sculptures that once held medicinal packs and divination objects. 
This essay shows some of the extraordinary ways that the artists and healers from different societies in Africa have used such items since the 18th century. It brings together 10 objects of the Eskenazi Museum of Arts collection to explore the relationship between art and healing through connections to powerful materials, belief systems, and divination practices. Although we do not know the names of the individuals who made these objects, they likely held important roles in their communities. Collections specialist Emma Felsey explains why we don't often know these artists' names in this essay. Do you want me to carry on? Yeah, yeah, just, oh. just have one example of that necklace. Oh. I think we'll okay. stop there. Yeah. Uh, materials can be powerful tools in healing. This gold necklace with an amulet case from Somalia, 18th century, illustrates the combined power of materials, actions, and proximity to the body to foster good health. It features an oval-shaped case that could hold paper inscribed with verses from the Quran that when worn close to the skin act as a healing amulet. In parts of West Africa that practice Islam, such links between Quranic text and the body appear through wearing clothing inscribed with Arabic text and drinking water that has washed over writing boards filled with verses from the Quran. The museum also holds pages of Quran manuscripts from the Islamic world, including this leaf from a Quran written in Kufic script from the 19th century. Yes, that's good. So thank you so yeah. much. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. yeah, going on. So um, I think that, and I'm glad that museum at Indian U University really has that collection. And this collection, I hope also should um, be things we should have exhibitions like this in africa itself because sometimes like you are easily you can easily find these materials in these countries for various reasons than back home but that spoke to me partly because for me for example music was a form of mental health and that's why i struggled i talk in my the book how i grew up in two worlds on the one world i was so poor materially and that you know even sometimes go to dumpsters to eat but on the other hand i was also rich okay because i grew up in one of the best musical settings the palace was right around if you want to hear drums if you want to hear languages music of sorts, sorts i was uh, surrounded by all this and what we always miss is that how this kind of um wealth which is not measured in material terms can actually be powerful because otherwise, if my mind would blow up because of poverty, I would not be able to achieve anything. But I think with music, I had something to hold on to. Now, uh, some of you uh, may have heard of uh, what's happening in Rwanda in terms of uh, the economic uh, progress they've made. And Rwanda is a very big story um, um, around the world because of economic um, issues, uh, at least progress they've made. But as many of you remember, Rwanda has a huge, huge scar which is the genocide. And when I was researching my book, I, um, I landed on this group called Ngoma Sha, which I talk about of female drummers uh, who decided to form a drumming group. First of all, I think they say that when uh, a long time ago, women not even allowed to touch a drum in Rwanda. But these women want to get this drum, start this troupe to dance and drum, and partly because it was a healing process for them. Now, it's very easy to see in some of some of the circles we go to some of us, like, oh, but, you know, if you can have nice roads and have big buildings. But as someone I quote, says, you know, you can easily build a building, construct a building or repair a building, but how do you build a person? I think these ladies get the drum and uh, you can uh, do a research about them. You can find out more information around to try to help them with um, their healing. Because some of the things they went to, my visit in Rwanda, I remember some years ago, was very traumatic going to that museum of genocide to see the instruments or the, how they really use machetes to cut people. It's quite difficult to, to bear. But I think some of these ladies um, lost either their husbands or children or they are raped. And how do they really heal? So I think uh, by drumming, that helps them psychotherapy like catharsis to try to get them to um, improve their lives through something they really can um, do themselves and be in a community where they can find healing with each other through drumming. But also the gender, the gender dimension here is basically interesting because a lot of women, many of us, it should be clear and we should know this is unequivocal. They actually suffer more in issues like wars and things like that. 
So having that there is a group of women who are also trying to promote their own awareness through what they are doing, not some kind of intervention from Europe, but from your culture to try to heal themselves, is quite important uh, to understand how the arts can promote uh, global health equity. And then the other thing which I'm fascinated with, uh, with my interests, I love architecture. And, um, and this comes to mind partly because the 2022 Pritkiza Prize in architecture, this is the highest prize in architecture. I went to um, um, someone from West Africa who I have been following his work for some time. I admire his work greatly and it's Francis Carey. And Francis Carey um, really has done a remarkable job. He, so he got um, this prize, I think a few weeks ago, and I, I saw this story in the New York Times and I'm quite uh, delighted about this. But as some of you may know, African architecture is not really something which is taken seriously. We need to take it more seriously. But architecture can be healing because as um, uh, one article from a website called Rethinking the Future says, uh, the concept of designing architecture spaces by considering natural factors like sound, light, color, smell, and pleasant views certainly connect to human senses and proves to show more ability in the physical and psychological healing of patients. Architecture spaces directly affect human emotions in a way that present architecture setups um, in the natural process of healing. So I think even as we build the architecture of um, the global consortium um, in terms of uh, promoting um, global health equity and inclusiveness, I think architecture, music, poetry, and all these words uh, we talk about as trying to be decolonizing or inclusive can go together if with science to promote a more inclusive and equitable world in terms of public health. And I want to thank you so much for having me, uh, giving me this opportunity to speak with you and I look forward uh, to the uh, questions you may have. Thank you. Quentin, you're muted. Sorry, I tried to unmute and mute it again. Thank you, Patrick, for, for this uh, great uh, talk and uh, your insights into the arts and humanities. I've put a couple of uh, items in the, the chat, um, uh, both uh, a link to Patrick's book, um, which was very well reviewed. If, in case you want to obtain a copy, I've just started reading it and it's, it's very interesting. So we have uh, quite a lot of time now for Q and A, uh, and uh, you can either put questions in the chat or um, uh, verbalize, which makes it easier, um, either with or without your camera on. Um, I'll just start it off in the interests of um, getting the communication, uh, the, the discussion going. Uh, Patrick, um, tell us a little bit more uh, about the entire topic of your book, um, how the arts promote uh, development and why they are important in that component with the link to decolonization. If the arts promote development, um, as you say in your book, how does that help with decolonization? On the one hand, the link may be fairly obvious, but I'm curious to hear your your thoughts, if at all, they don't may not be involved in that particular link. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and actually, when I was writing the book, I wasn't thinking so much in the terminology of decolonization. Sure, but yeah. Definitely a very interesting link when you look at international trade and services. Okay, some of you know may know that Africa imports more music <laughs> from its own music than actually. It's, it's actually one of our greatest places of these kinds of creative endeavors. Why is that? Because, you know, <laughs> we associate all things basically produced from France to be great. So, and one of them, um, um, and that's just an example. So one of the things I talk about, I think in chapter four, five, and six, maybe chapter, yeah, th yeah, I think those three chapters is the issue of nation branding, where a lot of you know that Africa basically is not really seen in the light of, um, its strength is always there's something wrong about Africa. In fact, the recent New York Times article 
I showed Britain yesterday was saying, oh, there is this dilemma uh, why Africa is not struggling with COVID. Because <laughs> it was predicted, some of you may know Bill Gates and others, as soon as COVID started to get out of China, it's like, oh my God, Africa is going to be hit. But that's a default kind of situation like, oh, you know, this is always going to be, and that really has a lot of trouble uh, in terms of economic progress and how we see African decolonization. I'll give you an example. Um, I'll not, I will not name names, and this is not about shaming, but I have some very good friends who went to a very famous um, Ivy University in Connecticut, and they are actually priests, and they wanted to go to Tanzania some years ago because they liked to watch birds. But then Ebola came up. Um, in West Africa, somewhere, was it Sierra Leone or someplace in West Africa, Ebola cropped up. And as you know, probably Tanzania and somewhere in West Africa, it's almost, you know, completely different. It's not around the corner. It's a lot of ways, a lot of, you know, hours um, to fly from one place to the other. But these people, and they are not stupid, they are not uh, uneducated, or they are not unaware but they cancel their flight because they say oh okay well if there's Ebola in Africa we're not going to go to a bad trip in Tanzania and that's partly because of, and actually that kind of tourism is the national trade okay, in services and these are things I talk about so the way the image of how we see Africa sometimes when these things happen we, we are at a loss and one of the things we need to do is the branding of our continent to see this as a place of backwards as a, a place of progress and I think in terms of development we need to get that message out there and there's a lot of things about traditional medicine so what if you know there is a claim for example in intellectual property that some of the medicine we use actually come from forests in Africa Brazil and some place but in terms of intellectual property indigenous medicine in Africa is it taken seriously I don't know and I don't think so <laughs> partly because international trade is always seen to be coming from these other places where indeed, whereas in Africa, we actually do have the resources to deal with some of these issues. So these are issues which can be done in terms of development. And maybe some of us who know about African medicine, I would like to import some of this medicine, which is done by migrant great great pundits, um, which they basically came up with the way it works. And they can easily ship it to me, but that's not easily possible, as you know. So how do we disconnect these kinds of issues so that book in terms of international trade talks about those issues yeah thank you um patrick i mean richard you have a question so if you want to, if you have a question it's probably a good idea to raise the electronic hand i can follow you more easily yeah. or put mm -hmm. questions in the chat whichever is easier go ahead uh, richard yeah um i i think first of all uh, thanks quentin and uh, patrick uh, very much uh, thank you for your remarks it's good to, to connect with you although here in nairobi last time we talked i was in boston but i'm i'm now here and it's good to hear your remarks and uh, hear learn a little bit more uh, in, in the in your, about your book um i was just thinking as you were speaking and in a follow-up with a question from quentin a bit more in your perspective, your book, The Cultural Wealth of Nations, um, to me, the title speaks to the importance of valuing cultural and art and cultural art, music, and in whatever form it comes. And that whenever we do GDP calculation and estimation, we don't take those uh, cultural artifacts into account. And so, in that case, and, and of course, World Bank uses a ranking uh, system for you know GDP per capita and so on and so forth. So I'm curious whether there is a way you can think of, oh, well, could you do a ranking across countries of how wealthy they are with their cultural art? Uh, and then secondly, there has been historically a lot of art uh, expropriation from the African continent during the period of colonization and probably yes. beyond that. Um, do you, um, you know, engage in discussions about how can we get these, these cultural um, appropriated art back into the continent? There's no, it, it's almost humiliating to go to London, yes, yes, yes. London Museum, and then see artifacts from Africa in this museum in London, and that should belong where it, it came from. Yes. Um, so you can speak about that and maybe as a process of decolonizing, bringing back all of the art back into the continent. 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, first of all, one thing I should mention, which I should have mentioned earlier when Quinton has this question, that development has tended to be seen just in gross uh, um, GDP, <laughs> gross domestic product material terms. And it has never, it's really struggling to catch up with other things like culture, where development can be seen that way. So if you look at material terms, that's where the trouble comes from. That's why Amartya Sen's work speaks to me quite um, often because he's one of a few who I've seen who has unequivocally been very strong at making, let's go beyond measuring, basically, um, economies based on GDP. And one example he uses, which I'll bring in very quickly, is that, for example, and it's in this case, he was talking about some from India. Someone from India could be very poor, and this can be me, because <laughs> I can relate to that, materially. But then, they can live up to maybe 46 or 57 or something. They have been in India in a squalor. Then someone right here in Baltimore, not far from me, they have TVs, big phones and stuff. They can't pass 18 years old. Do you see that? <laughs> they are in the richest country. So what is this? So because we quit, always thinking that, oh, because this country is rich, everyone will do that. Well, <laughs> because this country is poor. Because, but it's actually not that simple or true. And then um, when you're looking at the issue of trying to bring back our art back to Africa, it's again based on the materialistic kind of view. It's like, oh, these countries are poor. Because some of our questions I've written with a colleague from India about this in The Guardian. There's the an article we wrote uh, called um, African Art to Return Home and Why. And this is why it's in the Guardian. And all the comments of people were saying, oh, but these countries are poor. How can you send, you know? But actually, <laughs> they think that Africa is a country <laughs> most of the time. Well, maybe Ethiopia things are not going well, but maybe actually Tanzania is okay. Maybe South Africa is okay. Maybe actually Namibia, it's fine. Or maybe Ghana, things are great. So should we have a rotating museum? That's not the question which comes up. They just think, of, oh, France, and these countries, and these things were even looted, <laughs> you know, some of them were not really uh, taken um, uh, by agreement or things where there was a lot of forgery and things like that. Some countries like France are really, in fact, even in England, they are trying to return some of the pieces, and this information is, uh, you may have seen some of this. But one of the key issues we are talking about mental health, one of our friends from um, India who asked me to write him, to write this article about returning African art back home to him was to do with what he did to his mind. He was traveling, I think it was Germany, you see this Queen Nefati, the bus there, and it's, they're mimicking <laughs> the light, the warmth it will be in Egypt and somewhere cold <laughs> in Germany, <laughs> I think it was. It's like, why can't this be returned where it, it comes from? And those issues affect your mental well-being. Many of us who are from abroad, many countries, sometimes mentally you can, it can be it can take a toll on your mental health. But we're always feeling that you're being put down. <laughs> For this friend of mine, he remembered how India had this very big kind of, I don't know what it is, but it's a big piece of art or architecture, which the English wanted to take, but it was too big. They had to cut it into pieces. <laughs> I will not tell you how many hours this man talked to me about this. Definitely something was really bothering him mentally. And he's a serious economist, does a lot of work, but it's something he felt he needed to release and talk to me about because it was not okay. <laughs> so these are some of the, so you see how it can also relate to mental health and well-being. Uh, people are being respected and being feeling that the space is actually respectful and not always being really thought of as lesser. <laughs> yes, yeah. Thank you. Um, I think we have a question from Idioma. Go ahead, Idioma. Yes, good morning. Can you hear me okay, Quentin? Perfectly. Yes. Awesome. You. Yes, good morning. And good morning, Brother Patrick. That was an outstanding offering. Thank you for that conversation. My name is Dr. Ijioma Nodimopara. I'm based in Detroit, Michigan, US, but I'm originally and always from Nigeria, West Africa. Woohoo! So good morning to everybody. Good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are in the world, in the galaxy, calling in on this morning. I'm excited to be one of the facilitators of the breakout rooms later in the day. So um, my question for you you, sir. Uh, first of all, I want to really lift up um, another important aspect of my identity is that I'm also a performing artist. And so, um, and I'm steeped in the humanities. I was born into it through my mother, who's um, 
uh, literature and language uh, uh, professional and trained. Um, and then I got my, sci my, my physical, I suppose, sciences from my dad. So I've always been into literature and poetry and music and dance and, and, and essentially performing arts. And I've, I've, because again, being an African woman, right? Um, mm -hmm. I would say that I've a learned, conditioned, socialized way of really being a weaver of all aspects of uh, identity into an intersectional uh, reality and way of navigating the world. And so my medicine, my, my, my clinic, my work, my research is informed by my, my art, my art, right? And mm -hmm. exactly what you said, the ability to connect. You, we, you can research and discover all day long, but if you're not able to translate and connect it to people, humanity, communities, and have that be translated to solving um, their problems and mm -hmm. solving and addressing their needs, as well as lifting up their humanity and dignity, then what, what is the point? What yeah. is the point? So I really um, uplift uh, all the things that you shared and what I wanted to ask you, and I think you started to sort of hint at that, Brother Patrick, is um, can the art right, in the ways that you are beginning to, to, to lift up uh, this morning, begin to redefine uh, the, and reorder the world in the ways that uh, decolonization really should be about, right? Because ultimately decolonization um, goes hand in hand, all, it, it's a roadmap to liberation ultimately and the reordering of the world where power is not concentrated in one part of the world at the cost and expense um, of the other of others right and so can it be a way to reorder even onto language and what i mean is where we define places context settings countries nations communities societies according to quote unquote resources Mm -hmm. And it's like, what resources are we referring to, right? Mm -hmm. Usually it's income uh, or yes. economic mm -hmm. resources. So that's why we say high income country, low middle income, co income country, middle income country. But what if, as, you, as your book says, if we redefine what wealth and resource is, according to culture, then we are referring to different parts of the world as high resource and low resource, isn't it? And what would that mean, therefore, for the ways that we begin to language and conceptualize the world and we begin to reorganize the allotment of uh, resources, we begin to reorder, uh, reorganize uh, policies along trade, uh, organize um, uh, processes along engagement. What would that mean? What could that mean? So I want to imagine a little with you, my brother, and what your thoughts are. If we began to really count art and culture as wealth, what would that mean for the ways that we organize and think about the world order today? Yes, yes, I thank you, um, Dr. Opara, for that question. As you said, from Nigeria, Nigeria actually shows up a lot in my book because of Nollywood. <coughs> and I think chapter four, five, six, and partly China Chiba is a big influence of my work. So I definitely um, applaud some of the smartest people I know in the world are uh, from Nigeria. <laughs> so, and actually, great, uh, great inspirational writers also. I know uh, Nigeria is a great country. And that's why sometimes when people ask me where I'm from, like, oh, if I'm not from Nigeria, maybe I should say I'm from Wakanda because it's closer <laughs> to, to Uganda <laughs> and it rhymes with Kabanda. Uh, but indeed, if we go, and actually this will also uh, go to um, uh, Richard uh, Wamai's question. Yes, if we go to try to populate countries by their cultural wealth, Africa will come up so high. Tell me how many writers who are, from the non-Western world, who have made a huge influence in the world. If you take out Nigeria, for example, what are you going to be left with? <laughs> if you take out uh, uh, Professor, um, 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 who are, uh, I think, the professor from Kenya, I, I, I have his book, uh, Bugi what, what Yongo. Yongo. Yes, yes, Bugi I have uh, his son's book here. I mean, yeah. those people, I mean, the intellectual contribution, you never, um, the gentleman who recently won a Nobel Prize, I actually was ashamed myself, I never knew who he was, the Tanzanian gentleman um, who writes. Uh, you could only tell the profound work he's done through um, <coughs> the, the, the people who, who knew who he was and the reviews he were talk, uh, talking about his work. And what is surprised talking of decolonization, everyone was shocked. Bookstores was running to get his books and people trying to translate them because he was neglected. And I'm not going to sub, uh, basically uh, c conclude or think that I know the answer, but I think it could be like his background. People were not taking his subject seriously. Partly, maybe <laughs> he comes from this place where, you know, no one ever, it, there's a tendency of not taking people seriously. So one could argue that. 
but we need to so if we take <coughs> culture as the standard of course africa is going to do very well. no wonder i mean as at least from what we know all of us came from africa and the diversity of africa i'll tell you okay in uganda congolese music has been very very influential but a little i've traveled you go to south south what it has and actually if you even look at nature um, I didn't talk a lot about landscape architecture, but if nature itself is wealth, you go to a place like South Africa and be like, no wonder when the Europeans came, they didn't want to go back. Because <laughs> okay. the wealth, in terms of the way it looks, it's a beauty in, in, in talk about the music and the art. And you go to Zimbabwe, go to Kenya, I mean, <coughs> go to Namibia, go to um, Egypt, go to um, Ghana, go to um, Nigeria, to Slarion, go to the Congo, go to Sudan. Basically, we have, in fact, some of you maybe have, have also known this. Recently, I discovered last year, writing a chapter for World Bank book with someone, that actually, Sudan has the largest collection of pyramids. That's something I never knew. Because <laughs> there's a tendency to think that, oh, they're always fighting as a dictator, and we live at the culture wealth. That country is, run, is on the top of many things. So I think there's a need to go that and and me myself have and actually this will go on to try to also answer um, more on which are discussion i've tried to, to produce something called a culture trade index but that was a numerical index in the template of a world bank kind of areas like gdp where we can say okay, well kenya makes such and such million dollars from selling music to india or from exporting music across the world and we just realized that actually uh, Nigeria or Sudan has the largest collection of music students who come from abroad, okay? And uh, South Africa is the largest ex exporter of African fine arts, okay? So things like this, we can, and we're trying to see how do we get, now we know, for example, I'll tell you that France is the largest consumer of music from West Africa. Uh, and I think maybe because of French connection, some of these countries which are colonized. And we know that because people talk about it, but I know probably Pandora, or, or, or Spotify, or these places may know a little bit of this because of uh, how people are downloading music and how they are getting it from the internet. But that's not a culture <laughs> kind of index which will be like, okay, how can we, I don't even, it's even possible. It's like almost, how do you measure the value of a human being? It's impossible to know that. We put our economy so Sign, but it's not possible to do that. So I think it's um, something which really it should just make us proud that we have a lot <laughs> to offer. Yes. Thank you. Um, I think Kupreet Kalrana, if I've pronounced your name correctly, go ahead. Go ahead with your. You may be muted. Yes, hello. My name is Kupreet Kalrana. I'm at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. Um, and I am a global health librarian. Um, I come by way of Canada with of Indian heritage. Yes. And um, so I, you know, um, Patrick, I was very intrigued when you were talking about um, Indian colon, colon, um, colonialism. And it just reminded me of something. Um, when I was a teenager, I had the opportunity to go to England mm. and some family took me to see the crown jewels. Yes. And um, and as I was going through and saying, these belong to Africa, these mm. belong to India, mm. these, you know, and so it's, it was interesting to me now when I think of the artifacts and art of a colonized country, of countries becoming part of the cultural and power dynamics of the <laughs> colonizer. Yes. And I, I really don't know if I have a question, but the idea of if we connect um, colonialism to how we decolonize global health, and mm -hmm. I know we are thinking about that in both mind and in action, mm -hmm. but I'm very interested to know what you think about that idea of the power identity and the cultural identity of the colonizer being taken from artifacts and art of the, those that are colonized. Yeah, yeah. So thank you so much for that question. And I'll try to answer it maybe <clears throat> in a two-part or indirect way to get to, uh, to, to, to I think, um, what may be <laughs> at least a sufficient answer, satisfactory. So I think this is the way we can look at it in terms of branding, okay? So 
if I go to, I'm from India and I go to England, I've been told in my mind that, oh, you know, India is lesser than the UK because, look, even they were able to get our, their museum have our artifacts from home. They are more developed than us, okay? Of course, uh, not even considering a chicken tikka masala has become the national food of India <laughs> because English food is not. <laughs> but there's this uh, power dynamic, which is like, oh, Okay, it's very actually. There's even someone who did research in India on India itself how that can also be manifest in how we think. So I could be a researcher trying to understand COVID, and I'm in India. Okay, but because I'm in India, me myself, I'm not even take myself seriously because I think, oh, of course, the labs in the UK are the best to come. Yet actually, you know, you have this medicine. And actually, which I think modern and some of these companies have gone into uh, debates on these issues where, like, you know, they won't want to send these medicines. It's like, oh, there are no facilities there. Why people like, why don't you just give them and see what they're come up, coming up with? Okay. But the issue is that your work is less likely to be taken seriously, at least in some cases, partly because they think you are Indian and what will you be telling us? Okay. <laughs> and someone in the UK could make all sorts of mistakes, partly because they are the university, of course. So what? <laughs> Uh, they would know what, it, and that's why I think the work of Richard Wamai can be quite powerful and interesting because of trying to connect these two worlds. Because indeed, yes, they could have the machines, but you have the knowledge okay, from your own experience in India, which can inform us. And even in the context of okay, in India, this is what they do, and this is they are not going to take vaccine this way, or this is they tend to their diet is like this. Maybe this is the way we should look at it. But that tends to be, and many of us from these countries, I think, have experienced that. To completely be disregarded, partly because of a pandemic. dynamic. <laughs> so it shows up. I hope that answers uh, your question because indeed you could be a scientist, you could be someone, but because you come from these other countries, sometimes your work is not well funded or something, partly because of where you are. For example, you may find even you have a wonderful article in a journal, in an Indian journal, about what COVID, the next variant, may be what may cause. But because it's not a prestigious journal from MIT or some other place, <laughs> Oxford or some place, then it may not be taken seriously. You know what I'm trying to say? Yes, actually, <laughs> it does have this. So these variations, um, I'm not trying to pin a finger point here, but you see, that this is, I think, happens. <laughs> and I think a number of us may have seen variation of this kind of thing in, in, in one way or the other. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Patrick. Um, we have Mary White. Uh, the question, Mary, go ahead, unmute, yeah. Hi, <clears throat> hi Patrick, what a wonderful talk, wonderful co uh, topic. Oh, thank um, you so much. I, am, I have traveled a little bit in Uganda myself. Oh, and excellent. appreciated the arts everywhere I went. <laughs> um, but one thing I noticed was um, in a number of places where tourists were likely to frequent, representative painting. Mm. Um, I used to stop by a church on my way to the market where the church music and dance when I attended there uh, involved um, rhythms and harmonies that are, are very not Western. My question for you is, you talk about the wealth of nations in terms of its culture and art. Um, it implies a kind of fungibility of the art. And I'm a little concerned that if major uh, consumers of African art are Western, that there's going to be a push to homogenize what is indigenous and unique and special into something that Westerners will recognize and want to buy. Yes. And that something very precious yes. and critical could be lost in the process. Yes. Yeah, yeah. so that's a, a good question and comes up all the time. And that's why some people call about the, the um, what is it called? The commodification of art. Okay? That's why some people go there. So that's something which in some of us have pushed back, for example, the issue of Macdon the Macdonization thesis, that everything should be looking like you go to Nairobi, Kampala, there's some sort of McDonald's and stuff, and we're losing the local touch of local coffee shops. And also the Hollywood culture. I mean, myself, I've talked about this. Unfortunately, some of these things are impossible to fight. For example, when I was growing up, I was so interested in jazz and gospel music. At my own church, I suggested one of our members, um, a leader in the church, why don't you try to have um, 
some gospel or jazz music which actually has African roots, definitely, a lot of that. But the pushback was so, no, 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 we have to be like St. Paul's London. Because this is the way it is. You see what I'm trying to say? So that has gone on. That's there. And no wonder I think I talked about the curriculum. The way we think that we have to be trained as civil servants according to the British, <laughs> not the way we should emancipate our own thinking. So those kinds of things are inevitable. And what now what you're going to find is that um, some musicians indeed will want to rap or do this and that. And that will always be there. I think it's impossible. Culture purity, if you may, it's impossible to I think even Amatya Sen talks about this issue that you can't really get um, it's impossible to get rid of. For example, if you go to England, I think that t chicken tikka masala may be as, as nice as that in real India. You may get a chance but don't be surprised there could be variations that will be watered down. Blah, blah, blah. I remember actually eating Chinese food as a student in New York and I used to get it because it's cheap and one you buy <laughs> one meal and you can eat it for three days. I went to Hong Kong for the first time in 25, I'm like 2005, I'm not, I'm not a vegetarian, my host was a vegetarian, I was given vegetarian food from Hong Kong, I would not believe the difference between what I knew in New York because the, the watering down has happened so much, so indeed when you try to cater for some tries or things like that, uh, like that things may be watered down and that's something which we need to, the ministers of, of, ministers of culture have to fight so 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 much. Now there will always be a lot of borrowing. For example, the word motor car, in my language, I was talking to someone about it the other day. It's really motor car, but in Uganda, we adapted it and we use it in a different context, okay? But, um, so those kinds of things will always happen, but it's not right to be like, okay, even all our languages should be beaten to speak our languages at school. Yet we now know that actually speaking more languages is good for you. Or we all have to paint like this. What's very funny, like Picasso was influenced by African art. And I'm not trying to say you should not be influenced by African art, but it would be sad to say like, oh, now if you don't paint like Picasso's way, then you can't make it because he set the standard, although he himself was influenced by African art. So we need to try to see how do we promote our work. Even in economics analysis, just the pure economics, there's a way where people want to be something different. There will be people who want to buy something because it's truly authentically African and don't want to, don't want to copycat. <laughs> okay? And it has happened in many occasions and we need to safeguard that or promote it and not always think that what happens from the way so we need to get a tourist uh, visitors from the way is, is great. In fact that touches on the issue of cultural tourism I talk about. It's not right for people to go and start performing or dancing because that's what people tourists want. It's very delicate. How do we balance it and trying to do things which are authentic? <laughs> Yes, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Patrick. And th thank you, Mary. Good question. Um, so um, I have a question. Um, and I put a statement in the chat, um, which has always intrigued me um, by the American poet Mary Carr. If you ever doubted the power of poetry, we can put art in that word there. <laughs> Ask yourself why in any revolution, poets or artists are often the first to be holed out and shot whether it's Spanish fascists murdering Garcia Loco, Stalin killing Mandelstam. We poets may be crybabies um, and sissies, but our pens can become nuclear weapons. Um, so the role of the arts in sustaining and maintaining democracies, I think is a critical point because the arts in many ways are about um, tolerance of ambiguity, uncertainty, and uh, puzzlement, all the things that fascists don't like. And any democracy should be inherently inefficient at some level to contain all the different voices uh, in a democracy. So the world is now in a precarious state, as we all know, in Eastern Europe. Um, and I, I'm just curious, the title of your talk had equity and your book is about uh, development but comment to me about as well about your thoughts on the arts in democracies. And I think I was telling you yesterday, you know, certainly we all know that Hitler banned jazz because it was too improvisational and he didn't yes. want people to improvise. Yeah. Yeah. Likewise, I visited Gabon some years ago, which is a dictatorship in Africa. And there was only one tiny, tiny museum in the whole of Gabon with a few African sculptures and you were not allowed to take any photos in there. 
the president felt too threatened by the arts. So the arts are a threat to authoritarian states. And I think it's something we need to keep in mind as well in terms of equity as well in democracy. Yes, um, do you want me to comment on that? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm just curious. Yes, definitely. Um, I don't know if this is appropriate to say here, but in Uganda, you know, one of our recent presidential candidates was a musician. Mm. Yeah. Okay. He's actually, I think, a young man, maybe in his 30s. And he was beaten, detained, but partly because of his music is what we well, had all this. And you know, many Ugandans are very young. So he had the message you could, and I, if things probably were fair, free and fair, it's not, we would not be surprised that he wins. Okay? <laughs> because his music was carrying a message and his popularity. But as you see, he was not able to win. And being house arrested and things like this, and even I think his children had to be sent out of our country. So we are going through this all the time. Indeed, <laughs> many dictators uh, try to suppress art. Um, and what I know, for example, there's a gentleman here, I am forgetting his name, but he has worked with Winton Mercedes, who actually said that jazz is democracy. <laughs> okay? And if was it Hitler who didn't like jazz <laughs> because it was so professional? In that if you play in a jazz in co combo, this gentleman's thesis is like, you know, you listen to each other. I can't play against you. Okay? And I don't know where you're going to pick it up. I just need to know how to go along. So there's a freedom of expression and trying to be able to all working together. If I try to dominate you in the ensemble, it will not come out. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So that kind of, even if I am, I want to always be on top, I need to realize that, okay, we are going, um, we have to work together. And that's why sometimes it scares them. And poetry, language can be very powerful. I'm not going to be surprised in Ukraine, some of the people who will be, um, uh, in Russia who will be kicked out, who will be <laughs> the writers, or, uh, poets, or journalists, people who do creative work and trying to show this is not the way the war is going, is not right, even photographers. Mm -hmm. So I think indeed we have to use, even South Africa, you know, I told you, I think the story about um, um, Lake Dube. Um, Lake Dube used to come to Uganda, I recall, at least in the early 90s when I was a young man, and one time I went to his concert because one of my piano students was, you know, one of the leading figures in Uganda bought me a concert to go to his concert, to Lake Dubé's, a ticket to go to Lake Dubé's concert. It was fully packed. But I remember what Lake Dubé said in that appetite was just being dismantled. He said, you know, look, guys, okay, appetite has been dismantled, okay, <coughs> and on the, law, on the books are saying it's no longer, we no longer have appetite. And it's going to take a lot of time to change people's minds. So we need to still have the struggle. And of course, music was really part of a struggle for appetite. People, especially economists, don't want to believe these kinds of things, but it's true. I don't think I've ever talked to somebody. I'm, I've never met Nelson Mandela, but from what I'm seeing from his readings, all of them music was this kind of pumping thing. It's almost a, a kind of food, a spiritual food or feeding on something which they have to hold on to, to power. Even here, the civil rights movements, spirituals and music, we are very part of all this and try to drive equity and freedom for everyone. So you cannot, not to say that the arts cannot be abused. <laughs> there are many dictators who take on the arts for, to, to promote their own agenda, but indeed, Absolutely. the arts can really be used for positive good. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, it, it's, it's a very interesting point. I mean, let's be very clear. The Nazis were great connoisseurs of the arts. They collected the arts. They, they were music connoisseurs. The people who, who devised much of the uh, uh, annihilation all had PhDs in, in, some, uh, in the arts or other uh, components. So the arts are not only a threat, but they're also appreciated. So it's, it's a depressing thought at some level that the arts, do the arts humanize us? Yes, yes at some level, but let's also not be under any um, uh, you know, um, illusion that, that, they, that they are not also appreciated by people who, who don't <laughs> really, uh, who are not democratic. So it's a, it's a topic for discussion in the breakouts as well. Um, Judy, uh, go ahead with your question. Thank you so much. Um, my brother Patrick, it's just been wonderful to listen to you. Uh, I'm certainly going to follow you moving forward, um, being my neighbor from Uganda. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask you, 
everything you say is true and can be seen and and certainly we we all agree i don't think there's anybody who doesn't agree with what you've said and examples and your own life history and so on my question to you is what should we do now to i first of all number one not to because i i feel it in my bones and i see it uh being an african living in africa that we are going to lose these things so you talk about Uganda. I lived in Uganda for 16 years. The, the palace of the king. Uh, countries like, um, I was just reading an article this morning that the Batwa in Uganda, mm. who are who spread across the DRC and Kigali here, uh, Uganda and Rwanda, um, have been thrown out of the, the forest to make way to protect the gorillas, which I think is good because I love those gorillas. But then I don't know if, if gorillas have more than humans, and that's another whole discussion. <laughs> and they have lost, because of being removed from their milieu, from where they, they, they live and breathe, have lost, they're going to lose their language, they have lost a lot of their skills. When you look at the artifacts that you've talked about that have been taken, uh, we know about Sarabate and how long it took to bring her body back to South Africa where she was born because they kept saying we are poor and so on. So my question to you is then, when I look at myself, I'm a nurse by profession and a lot of my work deals directly with the patient and human contact. So often like at the, you know, when you come to the end of life or when somebody's really sick, these things are very healing. Like you say, I've seen them myself. Mm. What happens when we, when our grandmothers who knew this tree and its medicinal value is mm. going to die and she has not passed that on because we are all going to Boston University and are not interested in anything African, like you said correctly. Mm. Um, what, what, how do we keep this, uh, Patrick, I think is what I'm asking, that the, the music, the dance, the poetry, the knowledge is dying, Patrick. Mm. What are we going to do? How do we keep it in Africa? Our pyramids are dying. Our artifacts are lost. Um, the, the, the northern part of the world is certainly not interested in preserving this. And then the southern part where we are ourselves, like you mentioned, the dictators and so on and so forth are also certainly not interested. What do we do, my brother? Over. So, I wish I had a very clear answer. <laughs> but me, myself, I don't know. All I can say is that there are things we can do. <clears throat> First of all, starting again, going back to the education, the curriculum. And that's why I like to use that gentleman's uh, beginning, the professor from um, Stanford, for two reasons. They are mostly instrumental, but they are powerful and useful. Because many of us, even in Uganda, being a medical doctor, oh, is a big deal. And then you win a Nobel Prize in medicine, oh, it's even a great deal. And then actually being a professor at Stanford. So there is all in Africa, this is, I know in Uganda, you go to Macquarie, you're a doctor, you go to study, oh my God, this is all great. But look at the thesis of this gentleman. Where did he get inspiration? Okay, from Basun. I can imagine him. Maybe he was me or somebody in Uganda. They will beat him. Things I didn't say these things here, but you know, I talk a little bit about the where they will tell us those who studied music. They will, we are Makerit was music, dance, and drama. I didn't go to Makerit <laughs> for many reasons. I was like I failed actually all my classes partly because I wanted to play music, and they were telling me to be in classes. I'm like I can't. <laughs> I rather spend ten hours on the piano <laughs> than being in class. But the, can you imagine, Makere University used to be the so-called Harvard of Africa. <laughs> well, actually, Harvard should be called was the Makere <laughs> of Africa <laughs> to change things around. But the music students there were called Mos MDD, Music, Dance and Drama, Mosiru Dalila, which means very, very stupid, if you can understand a little bit of Luganda. So what does that say? So all the, even as soon as we started Luganda, we all looked down upon. I mean, we are being spanked, and one of the things I think Koki or Thiongo talks about, do you know this cow, the, the, the skull of a cow? So if they caught you speaking Luganda on campus, they'll get this cow skull. <laughs> and they put you to wear it with a sign, I'm very, very stupid. Just because you are speaking your language. And now in terms of cognition, we again we are realizing that you speak more than lang one language is good for you. So one of the things is the curriculum, the African curriculum, decolonizing it, if you want to use the word, to try to bring in the appreciation of this. 
I spoke at the UN because incidentally, as you may know, last year, 2021 was the year of the arts and culture and um, heritage and culture for the African Union. And, um, and um, so it's a, it's, it was their theme of the year. So there was a lot of events and I had a, an opportunity to speak to uh, at one of these events at the UN uh, in these meetings uh, chaired by the Africa Special Representative for, for Africa at the UN. But basically what is clear is that the discussion of this colonization still again is like how do we get this done Th through politicians and politics? Yes, that can work. But I believe one of the things we need to do is our education system. And I mentioned something which in myself I was caught by surprise by someone who actually I think I have this book here uh, called um, Stephen Johnson. The book is called Wonderland. Okay, How Play Made in the World, Modern World. Now from this book, I learned that the African drum was the first system of mobile communication. And you know how I quickly believe that? I have a friend from Nigeria who told me that when they drum, they just don't drum. When they do this, it means something. If they do this, there's another thing. So in that, I could be here and you are somewhere, maybe 10 miles in the hills of Kigali, and I play something to warn you that there's <laughs> traffic on the street. The wild animals, the gorillas are coming, okay? So things, basically, in that was... In conceptually, it was able, we were able to communicate like that. Because, but you tell me in our science and technology classes in Kigali, in Kampala, in Nairobi, do we talk about these things? Everything seems to be coming from Silicon Valley. Okay? So we need to change this. So sometimes I like to um, chat on um, WhatsApp back home and write in Luganda. Believe it or not, I struggle with this thing to try to write the language even because it's trying to tell me to do it in English and it's supposed to be a smart because <laughs> the default means that the language if your name does it it will keep on to, and I spent hours I'm like you know what is this <laughs> uh, but we've been told we have to have smartphones <laughs> smartphones are the kind of default and the issue of um, and actually uh, Matya Sena has mentioned about this I think in his article about the spotted sparrow um, and even I think in his book Development as Freedom where some tiger in India could be saved but people are poor and they're being served. So I want to comment on that quickly as well that indeed some sometimes at least I know this from the West <coughs> people go there and they are fascinated with gorillas. Okay. In fact uh, Betty Bigombe when she was at the World Bank um, I think uh, um, as head of the fragility and conflict uh, um, sort of a department she we saw a video, I think she's the one who brought that movie or something, where they, I think it was shot somewhere in, either in Rwanda or, or Congo, <coughs> of some Africans who were stewards of these wild animals. And this, it was the first time I see a black person actually being in charge <laughs> of being connected to these wild animals, because we were almost seen as if we are traitors and not living together. So I think the Western model of, <coughs> of um, you see it in magazines here, of tourism, they want to bring in people here. I think actually many years ago it was five hundred dollars. I think from Kigali to go see this um, in Rwanda. If you want to go to see gorillas, some years ago, more ten years ago, I remember it was five hundred dollars. So the issue is like, okay, this is going to bring a lot of foreign exchange. So people should go away. Okay? But I believe that there should be a balance where, for many years, people were living with these animals. And how can we make sure we just don't kick them out? How can be custodians? That's something which need to be started. If they need to move, how can they move humanly while maintaining their own um, sort of uh, culture and lifestyle? And these are debates which we should be made, other than thinking that, oh, we should just, we, it's as if human beings are, are less important <laughs> and we are placing more value on uh, these uh, chimpanzees and wild animals. <laughs> so I think that a balance is needed. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Patrick yes. and Judy, for thank you, good, good question. Uh, we have Carol and Charles with a question. Unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, Carolyn, you, if you're talking, you're muted. We can't read your lips either because you. <laughs> Carolyn, are you still there? Okay. 
Uh, maybe she stepped away. Uh, we can't hear you. Perhaps you need to, you, your mute is on. She says she's connecting, yeah. Oh, reconnecting, let's give her a minute. Um, any uh, other questions while we wait for Carolyn? I've put, put some of your sources in the, in the chat as well. We've got a couple more minutes um, before we break out into the, while we're waiting for Carolyn, I'll just um, interject here a bit and then I have some comments. Here are the breakout rooms that we're going to go into. Please uh, join them. Um, the one will be indigenous knowledge, other ways of knowing uh, that Rosemary Jolly and Judy Cagnola will facilitate. The next one, historical anthropologic perspectives. How do we get there? Richard Wamai, I think it was Mary White, correct me if I'm wrong. What do we mean by decolonization? These are the definitions and epistemic issues, Revathi Ravi and Ijeoma, and then decolonizing the mind based on Nguguwa Tionga's concept, we cognitive versus structural decolonization. And I think Patrick, you had expressed an interest yesterday in joining that. Um, so, but we've got a few more questions. Uh, Richard, go ahead. Uh, yeah, thank you, Quentin. Um, I was just curious, listening to uh, you, Patrick, um, what, what new project are you working on, um, seeing that uh, you're, uh, you still have many years ahead of you to, to work, to continue to debate, to discuss, to, to even lament and be an advocate for African art and um, how are you going to spend the next decade of your life? Um, in this <laughs> well, I wish I would actually, I want to move back home. This is, as we talked the other day, it's something I've been, I want to, because I think it's, it's it would be nice to be on the ground. Yeah. It's not easy um, because believe it or not, especially in the Washington DC area, one of the things I've been, for example, if I was home, one thing I should lament to actually, Judy, I think I should say this too, we need to write, okay? There are some brilliant African intellectuals who have died, at least in Uganda, who have not produced books. And I feel really, really sad because when I would go home, we would have discussion with these people. Spell bounding uh, kind of intellectuals conversation. They, they've gone with all their knowledge. I know our culture is very old. Unless someone does video calls and records these people for documenting things that way. But I think in order to uh, basically shape the conversation we need also be more interested in writing uh, not interested basically i know the interest there but really making it like a big agenda all of you here have books in you so please <laughs> uh, this is something uh, which is more needed to try to also contribute to that knowledge so uh for me uh richard i think one of the reasons i am still here is because actually the washington dc area being able to travel around the world okay has been much easier. There was a time, this looks like <laughs> eons ago, but you could easily fly from uh, Washington to, to Beijing in a direct flight. <laughs> so this was just 2018. <coughs> so now I think if I was in Uganda, it will not that be simple. It will not be that simple. And of course, um, uh, travels to Europe and even there's a flight here from Washington to Ethiopia. <laughs> I'm sure you yourself, maybe you have even direct flight from here, uh, from Boston to, uh, to, 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 to Nairobi. So I think one of the reasons I am still around because I'm able to travel in that sometimes it's easier to do things here. What I was getting to if I was home, writing a book would be very difficult for many reasons. The research, <laughs> connectivity uh, <coughs> in terms of internet and also uh, sometimes the things you need to find very quickly um, in terms of uh, support networks and things like that it may not be that simple back home so that's one of the reasons but I, I am thinking of at least trying to make a dent in trying to make that a reality and I'm going to try to continue to write more one day I'm interested in starting to start an academy which will be connecting things to do with arts and culture but that's not tomorrow that's a long time from now Right now, my immediate thing is trying to do more research. There's another book I want to write, which is going to be quite, okay, maybe two, but quite tough. But the reason why it stops, why I think about it so much. <laughs> so those are some of the areas I'm thinking about. A lot more research um, to do um, in producing more work that way. So those are my <laughs> immediate, at least things I'm thinking about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, thank, thank, you. thank you. So I wonder, we're going to end this and then go to the breakout rooms and I'll ask Revathy to introduce the breakout rooms a little put some more expansion on that. But I want to make two comments. Um, one, one is meant to make you feel a little uncomfortable, Patrick, and then yeah. I'm going to make a comment. <laughs> that, oh, your trajectory has been very colonial. <laughs> you've been yes. to the Juilliard School, you've been, you taught at Phillips Exeter Academy, you've yes. been to Fletcher School. I'm glad to hear you, you're going back to your roots now. So, um, and that, that's, that's, I'm just teasing you in part about that, but um, I'm very yes. impressed as well about it. But Give me a brief comment about how you feel about that, because you said yeah, yeah. so, uh, that that's trap. definitely true, and I'm glad you brought that up. But part of it, the way we were we were grown up, okay, yeah. uh, because I remember even coming here, I wanted to study jazz piano, and I thought that oh, if I go to America, <laughs> yeah. you know, this is the mecca, and they were at least it's it's yeah. fair to say the professor in the beginning was not very excited about it, and I did not know that even in America, jazz is not that as accepted yeah. <laughs> everywhere you go, okay. <laughs> Um, because of that. But of course, we grew up being told you have to go to Mercatory, you have to do this and that. Yeah, St. Paul's London is where you need to play recitals. So when I came here, and actually, Julia School wasn't my first choice. People may know, I didn't even know what it was. I wanted to go to an, a school where I could do work study because I believe and still have that self sort of sufficiency kind of way of looking at life. But the school, which was my favorite, I never had from them, and other schools I never. Uh, got accepted or uh, I didn't hear back and believe it or not the only place I got a scholarship was Julia <laughs> so, <laughs> so the uh, the poor trying to make it yeah I ended up going to Julia and that was great and the great thing about Julia was this is that I learned that in each school there are wonderful students and students who are not ready to be there mm -hmm. in that not everyone at Julia the only thing that the standard is very high at least in their way that you can't is like go for, don't believe that everyone who goes there is a genius. I think it's true at Harvard, I think it's true <laughs> at NA. So basically, it's like that. And also, it showed me back home how I was lucky. I've never met as people who were as talented and basically quite broad and deep in what they did as the people I grew up with in Uganda. They all went to the UK because they also got scholarships there. Yeah, yeah. You know, but even at Julia, I did not see them. Now, for example, your, your mom plays the cello very well and is very famous in doing this. But I don't know how he improvises. I don't know how he, he sight reads. I don't know how he composes. Okay, okay. Uh, but these people I grew up with, one kid, you could even put the music upside down, who would still play it. Okay. And then he improvises, and not just classical, gospel, jazz, African, blah, blah, blah. And then he composes. Okay. So this, <coughs> the people who I grew up with were like that. We all just left because we thought that we would have to go outside the country. And then, of course, actually going to Phillips Academy, I wanted to go to a certain school where someone at Julia said, you know, Patrick, you know, I don't think you are just a musician. You should really go and pair your music with arts education because I actually had done a music tour of teaching um, um, music in East Africa, Uganda, Kenya. And it was a grant from Julia. And when this person was an international student advisor to me, you need to combine your music education with other things because and as I was looking for jobs and blah, blah blah trying to get I didn't get in where I wanted to and then I got this person said oh there's a job at Andover I didn't know what Andover was I ended up at Andover and then I didn't last there for some of the reasons <laughs> you just said and then I was going to go back to Africa I told Richard about this and Amatia sent me to the World Bank and all these things I'm grateful and this is the reason why going back to Juliet actually very forward thinking would you know that I think Steve Rake is considered the one of the leading, if not the best American composer? And you know one of the reasons, the major reasons why? Steve Rake was very smart enough to say, let me go to Ghana and start with a master drama. Steve Rake got a Fulbright, went to Ghana, <laughs> started with a master drama, came back, wrote music today. You can't match his creativity. So what I learned is that indeed, even in the Western sense, people who are open-minded can still make bridges. Messi yeah. and the French composer, I think he would love to go to the Congo to listen to birds and write the music down. Okay, yeah. But we tend to think some of us, have, uh, for example, one gentleman was complaining work with, a, I think, a, a very rich person in some country in West Africa. I said, they don't even want to buy furniture from their own country. They go to France 
to buy furniture. <laughs> Okay, sure. but we have very good people who make furniture in Africa. Part of it is colonized thinking. Now, yeah. Steve Rake yeah. is a good example to show that we have this wealth. Why don't we teach it? <laughs> he didn't go to university in Ghana. He went and started with a village a chief drummer to get his music. So these are things which Juliet was useful to understand that kind of context. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'll edit it. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I'd say in a few seconds, one more comment, because it's sort of an interesting metaphor or image. In your book, you do comment, as we chatted about yesterday, that Nashville, where I now live at Vanderbilt, is by far, by far the biggest recording city in the world. Yes. The recordings here are outstrip LA or any other city by four to five times. So, But the interesting thing is that the name Music City I don't think you, you, you had this in your book. Who gave the name Music City to Nashville? I don't know. I, it's been a long time. It's just called, I think, oh, Honky I, I, Jungle, there was something. No, yes. no, I'll tell, tell you. The arch colonialist in the world, Queen Victoria. Huh. Queen, <laughs> Queen Vic, and it happened, the Fisk yeah. Jubilee Singers from an African university in Nashville mm. in 1890 went to London and mm. sang before Queen Victoria. Huh. She was so impressed by them, she called her portraitist to, to do a huge portrait of the entire choir of the Fisk huh. Jubilee Singers. And she was so taken with them, she said, you must be from Music City. And the name, <laughs> and the name stuck. The arch and, 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 and what I'll tell you about this is that when I grew up, music, African music was not considered music. Yeah. Music, as some definitions, I think was a group dictionary or something um, like that, was like organized sound. So yeah. <laughs> sometimes some people may say African music may not be organized in a Western sense. So that was not music. That's clearly it's not true as people like Steve Rake have yeah, shown. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I just thought I'd raise that. So we, we're, we've, we've arrived where we should be a couple of minutes over half time. And we're going to go into the breakout rooms. Please join the breakout rooms. That is going to be where a lot of the interesting discussion happens. And I'm going to ask Revathi Ravi just to introduce them. I'll put the topics in the chat and Elizabeth Frost will um, uh, divide or open the chat rooms. If everyone goes into one chat room, she will forcibly remove you and put you into, an, into other uh, chat rooms. <laughs> uh, try and divide up uh, according to your interest. But um, Revathi, go ahead. Oh, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you all for being here. And thank you, Patrick. It's been really wonderful to hear your discourse as well as to have everybody kind of be able to engage with you with all these questions. Um, we're going to move on, as Quentin said, um, to the breakout rooms. And so when you're going into these breakout rooms, I want everybody to think about this question. And the question that we are asking everyone to think about is how do your arts, your history, your culture, philosophy, psychology, sociology, religion, implicate the work of decolonization for the frontline global health worker? And this is particularly because we want to move this, decolonize this subject from the academic to the frontline and ask, what tools can we suggest to our colleagues, to ourselves, to deconstruct these colonizing influences with the humanities for the frontline global health worker? Oh. To do this, we're going to have four broke breakout rooms. Um, the first is indigenous knowledge, other ways of knowing. And this is going to be moderated by Judy Cagnola, the chair of the Center for Nursing and Midwifery at the University of Global Health Equity and a nursing and midwifery leader from Africa, as well as Dr. Rosemary Jolly, a chair of literature and human rights at Penn State University, who has worked extensively in HIV and gender-based violence prevention in rural KwaZulu, Natal, South Africa. She has published on the interface between Western medical science and indigenous ontologies. The next breakout group is gonna be using this same lens in terms of tools for the frontline global health worker on historical anthropological perspectives. How did we get here? This is gonna be moderated by Dr. Richard Wamey, an associate professor at Northeastern University where he co-leads the Integra Integrated Initiative for Global Health. He works in global health research, training, implementation, and policy focused on HIV AIDS, neglected tropical diseases, non-communicable diseases and health systems and policy in multiple countries across Sub-Saharan Africa and is driven in his work by a passion for ending the neglect for disease and poverty-free communities, established the African Center for Community Investment and Health in Baringo, Kenya. 
and Mary T. White. Dr. Mary White is spent the last 25 years teaching medical ethics, humanities, and global health in Ohio, including teaching and working with NGOs in Uganda and Ethiopia. Her interests include how different cultural perspectives impact understanding of self and society, responses to suffering, and how to integrate human health and environmental health, global palliative care, pandemic ethics, and addicts management and medical education. Um, the next uh, group, breakout group will be actually moderated by two facilitators. There need no introduction, um, Dr. Quentin Nickbaum and Patrick Kabanda. They'll be doing decolonizing the mind, or, and Quentin probably pronounce this better than I can, Watiango, um, cognitive versus structural decolonization. Um, and then finally, the last breakout group is going to ask, what do we mean by decolonization? Definitions and Epistemic Issues. This will be moderated by Dr. Ijeoma Opara. She's a survivor of white patriarchal capitalism, supremacism, settler and non-settler colonialism, and neocolonialism, a physician scholar and activist and performing artist um, in black liberation medicine. She's also the chair of the CUGH Education Committee, Competency Committee on Anti-Racism and Decolonization, and a performing artist, and founding director of the Health Equity and Justice in Medicine, Wayne State University School of Medicine. Um, and I will be assisting her. I'm an internist and pediatrician at Harvard Medical School and Mass General Hospital. I spent um, over a decade working with global health systems, structural violence, and examining the effects of power, differentials to the narratives in patients living with HIV AIDS in India, Botswana, and Uganda. My current work lies at the intersection of emotional intelligence, power, human rights, social justice, and health equity and how we can use emotional intelligence to improve health outcomes and deliver on social justice for individuals. So as Quentin said, um, these are the four breakout groups and we want everybody to kind of um, choose different. If there, everyone joins the same a breakout group, you will be um, encouraged <laughs> by um, the, the powers that be to be moved into another group. And we're hoping that um, we can have a very lively discussion and that when you come back um, from the great bad groups, please assign somebody who is going to be a speaker on behalf of your group and come with tools, come with this lens of the, the group that you are in um, and how we can help the frontline global health worker with decolonizing through the humanities. And thanks, Ravati. So, Elizabeth, are you going to just number the breakout rooms? So, one is indigenous, two is historical, um, three is de uh, definitions, and four is decolonizing the mind, or do you have names on them? And then bring us out of the breakout room around 10.30 to 10.35 or 10.40, somewhere there, because we're a little yes, over time now. Yes. Okay. So, actually, if, if everyone looks at the bottom of their screen, they should see a breakout room selection. And then you should be able to see um, the different rooms, okay. the different names. And then you can go ahead and select which one you'd like. So I think we have like 15 minutes. We can maybe go over a few minutes. Um, but they're very rich discussions. Um, and they, they were so, um, uh, never have enough time for this. We want to report back here a little bit. And then I don't know if we'll have time to we have another group discussion, but we need to leave some time. So I did want to mention that uh, Shanaz Munshi, um, who was going to be a speaker but had an emergency to deal with and couldn't join us this morning, did eventually join our breakout group and had some very interesting contributions uh, to make. And she had offered to distribute her talk. Um, so um, Shanaz, maybe you can also speak a little bit about our group um but uh which group wants to go first well why don't you start off shanaz um our group was on decolonizing the mind and seeing shanaz hasn't had a chance to speak she had some very interesting thoughts about not just decolonizing the mind but potentially also decolonizing the body and shanaz is from south africa from wits university hi everybody i firstly want to 
make a deep apology for being late. It was um, something from work came up and I had to step in and, and be a, a host at a different meeting just before this. And I could only join when I could. But if there is time, I could also do my presentation now that I am here. Um, but I will talk about um, um, our group. And I think we had an interesting discussion about um, which made me think about what is the mind? What does the mind do? How do we formulate thoughts? And we had questions around um, biases and the different types of biases and what is difficult. And, and Quentin brought up the complexities of um, confirmation bias. But my contribution was really to think about the mind as, some, as not being split from the body. And when we think about... Um, uh, co colonialism and decoloniality, and we really look at um, coloniality in relation to power, knowledge, and being. Um, and coloniality of the being um, recognizes um, the whole human, and it's a it, it's where um, the structures of power come in to to really um, um, dehumanize. Um, those who are the colonized in relation to the colonizer, because colonialism is always a relationship of power. And this dehumanizing process can be othering, it can be dehumanizing, it can be alienating, um, but really that the trauma lives in the body and the mind. And we spoke about Steve Biko, a South African um, Black consciousness leader, that spoke about the most, his quote is the most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the minds of the oppressed. And in a way, I believe that the decolonial project is about dismantling that oppression. Um, it's about reclaiming our identities and it's about healing our bodies. Um, it's about shifting our consciousness to away from the dehumanizing towards dignity, a dignified life a full to be recognized in my full complexity of my humanity. Um, even as I straddle different intersectional identities, um, but, and, and I straddle identities that make me both um, part of the system of oppression and part of the system of being oppressed. Um, and I suppose that's kind of part of what we, we were discussing. And we also discussed the role of the university and how does one recognize or reckon or confront the university as a space which is structurally violent because it was um, uh, many of the philosophies are designed to alienate an other. And how do we shift cosmologies and, and look at, at, at people who live in rural communities or people who are part of indigenous ways of being and doing um, as part of the pluriversity of knowledge, um, as knowledge holders, knowledge creators, knowledge producers, um, and so on. Yeah, so that's kind of what we would discuss. Thank you, Sinat. Now I want, to, I'm gonna, I don't know if we can have more time to hear your talk, because it you had some interesting ideas. Um, is CUGH on the call still? I don't know. And would anyone want to, I don't know if we can extend this. How long is your talk? Uh, 30 minutes, 20 minutes, or one hour? Yeah, I can make it 20 minutes. And if I do it now, it will save me from trying to record it. <laughs> um, no, you can do both. Um, <clears throat> I don't know. I mean, would anyone have time to hear it? Are we allowed to stay on the call? Well, um, uh, Quentin, uh, I, I think uh, it, it could be valuable to probably just hear maybe a, an abridged a form of, of, of your talk, uh, Shanaz. Uh, and instead of uh, perhaps then reflecting on the group so that we can still at least try to remain within the allocated time, uh, given uh, Zoom fatigue and, and other engagements. Um, so maybe that might be more valuable to do. Sure. Well, I don't want to cut the other groups off from a brief report back. Um, uh, are you going to do your talk? Uh, um, uh, when you're ready, if you're ready, but it's ready. Yeah, I think in, in the interest of courteous to the other groups, unless anyone has another idea. Um, uh, I don't want to cut off the other groups from saying what they, they did. We'll just go over my 15 or 20 minutes. Um, 
and we'll we're left to show the powers that be that we 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 will we will do some good trouble here, as as uh, John Lewis said, and, and flout the, the hierarchies of power. Which, um, maybe um, Richard, did you want to uh, report briefly on on your discussion or someone in your group? Well, uh, maybe this is just a minute, in fact, to try to condense the time a bit more uh, than, than extend by too, for too much. Uh, but our group was uh, looking at uh, the historical and anthropological perspectives on the question at hand. And uh, one of the questions was, well, how did we actually get here? And so we reflected each of the members in, in the group, uh, in the breakout room, uh, at least five of us probably took a bit of time to reflect uh, on our own personal journeys and experiences given our content context uh, where we are in, in our history. So that was useful to hear. Uh, and the challenges and uh, of uh, the current uh, state of uh, of, of global health uh, operations. There were some examples given uh, on disease institutions, uh, issues to do with subjectivity, the top-down culture, and northern uh, ventriloquism, and, and also the approach of Western medicine. And, um, and then there was a reflection on um, uh, what needs to be decolonized. You know, I, I, I had written a whole list of things that uh, perhaps uh, can be targets for decolonization, even in the context of frontline uh, operations in global health. So one, for example, decolonize the thinking, you, you, you're one of your groups who focused on that, creativity is the other one, medicine, and these topics really are what uh, Patrick was speaking about uh, more generally. So uh, decolonizing medical knowledge, uh, communication language, uh, belief systems, governance, entertainment, lifestyle, um, and so on and so forth. And then ultimately, I think, uh, for me at least, it was about, uh, you know, as one of the major approaches that we ought to use is really valuing indigenous knowledge. Uh, and we gave a few examples of, uh, of, of how that can be done. Uh, practically and uh, in settings uh, in our projects uh, that we have tried to use at least um, a, a more uh, more uh, a, a more a better approach which is uh, guided by humility to be more listening to the person that we work with even the frontline in remote uh, settings as we are trying to improve global health uh, for neglected populations and that's it I'll just leave it back uh, you know leave it there for now thank you uh, Revathy. Did you want to, with your group or someone in your group on the yeah, so <coughs> definition? I think you were going to ask Stephanie. We're going to ask Stephanie, but Stephanie has to step step to the side. So okay. maybe just between you and I, we can give uh, a report. Are you okay with that? Yeah, that's fine. Um, um, did you want to start, Ijeoma, and then I can jump sure. in? Or how do you? My yeah. pleasure, my pleasure. So, um, Good day, everyone, again, and thanks for hanging in there with us. So in our group, we were exploring the definition or the redefinition, the deconstruction and or the reconstruction or reimagination of decolonization itself and sort of what does it mean or what could it mean? And so what kind of uh, came up and bubbled to the surface in our, in our group was to begin to explore the possibility that could decolonization really be contextualized inside of an understanding of love? In other words, could love really be what decolonization is um, all about. And so we, we, we talked about that. And then I offered a gift from my culture, my ethnic group, the Igbo of Nigeria, where we don't have a word for love per se. What we say is ahurunginanya, which means I see you. And that is the way that we express love is that we see the other person and you only see the other person really when you see yourself. And so that is expressed in many different ways throughout the world. But in so doing, then we talked about how love, therefore, as Colonel West said, is truly justice because just he said justice is what love looks like in public. And so uh, we looked, we explored how love can then show up inside of using the arts and humanities as the voice of the people, of marginalized people, of minoritized people, of disenfranchised people, of oppressed people, really to express um, themselves um, and therefore shift mindset, be a tool for shifting mindset in terms of our students and colleagues and others, um, in terms of shifting power dynamics that exist within the global health ecosystem, whether education, practice, work, or otherwise. Um, and we talked about how we can also show 
up inside of collaborative ex uh, exercises and activities across disciplines and sectors. Um, and we also talked about a number of other things, but I want to pause here and invite Revati to um, add anything that I that I left out. Yeah, so this question of what is decolonization really became what is love. And there's two sides of love, right? There's the love that we want and the love that other people may define for themselves that doesn't feel good. And so questioning love that might be power and dominance and abuse, and how do we repatriate or repair that or how do we undo that, unlearn that kind of love? And then what is love? Is it respect? Is it grounded in humility? Is it grounded in not knowing? and the groundlessness of unknowing and having to relearn and learn from somebody else's point of view and to really know that person in order to love them. And kind of thinking about what does it mean to hold that space of love and realizing that we exist in a humanity where not everyone is taught or knows love in its purest sense. Not everyone knows how to love themselves and how to see themselves. And we are so good as humanity um, to see the power structures in the world, to reflect those power structures because we all want to survive. But love isn't survival, we need it. But it could be something different, right? It could be a nourishment, it could be a nourishing. And so how do we, instead of decolonize, how do we love and enhance we quote unquote decolonize. And so um, I'm so thankful and grateful for our group that came in with this open heart and, and really, I think, had this beautiful conversation about love. Thank you. Thank you, Revati. I also love that statement, I see you. I thought it was also part of KwaZulu Natal, a greeting in the Zulu culture. That's it's interesting. It seems more universal than I thought. Um, let's get to the next group um, uh, on indigenous knowledge, um, which, which is really a very important and other ways of knowing. Um, I would have thought everyone would have flocked to that group. Um, so, uh, but I don't know why. <laughs> um, it's, it's a critical part of other ways of knowing, but oh. in the field roads, um, I know, but please tell us what you talked about. Yeah, so I ended up with um, Namosa and Goma and we're old colleagues and, and friends. So I think that what I would, uh, just to, to give a brief uh, piece of how we went about it, I was proposing that, you know, um, jumping off Sylvia Winter, I know that um, uh, Shanaz mentioned the coloniality of being, and this is um, the concept that um, Sylvia Winter talks about. And, the idea that the only way that we can, or one of the most helpful ways that we can approach indigenous law, knowledge is by understanding that um, the her point, which is that Western man, and let me just leave it that simply for the moment, Western man represents himself as if he were, um, as if he were all men. He overrepresents himself as humanity. And so the best way for us to understand the roles of many different kinds of indigenous ways of being is to understand that they contest that. And then we went on to make the point that, um, or to discuss the point that, it, you know, colonial man, um, colonial capitalist man, which Sylvia Winter critiques, is, has a lot of consonances and is the subject or is the, 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 the way in which medical education takes place is an assumption that that is the way to be human, right? And so right there, you've got a colonization of the entire, you know, um, medical curriculum by the notion that um, this way of being modern and this way of being human is what the subject matter is. And so just a quick example is, you know, people I taught um, one year, fourth year medical students from uh, KwaZulu-Natal, and you could tell that, you know, um, any kind of indigenous knowledges that they had, they were supposed to be to some degree ashamed of, right? Um, I have to say that Steve Reed was one of the people who stood up against that, but 90% of their education was like, you get rid of these belief systems and you 
implant a colonial capitalist man in order to make herself an efficient doctor. So we spoke a bit about that. And then I, I did go, I, we did go to the question of frontline front uh, workers. And I, you know, I have two, I've just written about this actually. So I, I had two ideas that we discussed. One of which is we cannot make frontline healthcare workers who are extremely burdened responsible for the entire structural violence of colonialism. So then it's like, how do, is it possible? What is the idea about having maybe a harm reduction approach in frontline healthcare settings to begin? So that the healthcare worker doesn't feel like they're victimized by taking on everything and also by not being able to basically undo a vast structure of colonial capitalism in the clinical encounter every time, which could be really traumatizing rather than decolonizing. So what might harm reduction look like in that setting, in that context? And the second thing we spoke about was the difficulty of empathy where the doctors and um, uh, patients and clients and communities are coming from di very different worlds because you know how you, how you empathize and what you think is important is based on your worldview. And so um, one example would be you know, trying to have empathy. Um, I, I did this myself. I was, you know, like a, a baby came in and had masses of lice and the nurse said to me afterwards, well, no, we don't clean that up because lice is endemic where that late baby lives. And so you don't want to create conditions of shame. This was in the very beginning of my experience in, in KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa. And so I, we were just talking about what are, the colonial elements of certain kinds of empathy. So those were two, two things about frontline work that we spoke about. I hope that was clear. That was my, that's as fast as I could go. There we done. Thank you. Thank you, um, Rose, so much. Um, these are very rich discussions and I'm not sure they're going to let us uh, continue, but Shanaz, please uh, do us the favor of recording your talk. I don't think uh, we're losing people now, and um, I'm not sure whether we will be cut off. Um, let's see, I've, I've emailed Confex and um, uh, Elizabeth also to step off. Please send us your talk. I think it will be very valuable. But I do also want to mention to everyone again that um, we have the Global Health Humanities Working Group. Quite a few of us on this call, the facilitators, are part of that. Um, Please, I put my email in the chat. Um, uh, contact me uh, to join. You know, the idea of this is to have voices from around the world, not just uh, America. And um, so, if you're interested in joining that group, um, uh, Charles, uh, Charles Antoine uh, Barbeau Meunier, long name, is, is the uh, administrator and now co-chair of that group, who's not on this call, but um, he, he's also someone to be in touch with. Email me if you're interested. I definitely would like uh, other people to, to join and enrich the discussion, Patrick and Richard and Shanaz and all the others. Um, <coughs> um, <coughs> the discussions here are so, so rich and we had hoped to have time to see how to move this forward into um, you know, uh, articles and uh, you know, more of a, 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 I don't think one always needs a product, <laughs> but, but it would, would be useful to have that. But um, I do want to invite some other comments from people on, on the call, um, the facilitators and maybe next steps, but definitely a next step is to join the Global Health Humanities Working Group. If you go on the CUJH website, you can see some of the people involved and uh, uh, be, be, feel free to join it or email me to see how to do that. Uh, Revathy, uh, Rose, whoever else is on the committee, Mary, did you want have anything else to say or add? I just think this was really rich and we've got a lot of people in the community asking to do it again. And I also noticed that Navneet was really wanting to join Mary White's um, course. I don't know if you saw that, Mary. Um, I did not. Yeah. So if you could communicate with Navneet, that would be great. I think she's very excited to join your conversations. 
Um, yeah. Neat. Send me an email, please, if I don't catch it before the chat goes away. I'd love to be in touch. Okay. I don't see an email yet. She says she'll email me. Oh, you said you'll email me. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. I do also want to thank Patrick again very much for a, a really nice talk, very interesting. Uh, get his book, um, read his book. It was a good, great contribution. Um, Patrick, are you going to join the Global Health Humanities Working Group? Please do. Put you on the spot here. <laughs> I, I am very happy to join if you take me to Wakanda for real. But be <laughs> 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 happy to join happy. anyway. And thank you again for this opportunity to speak with you. Yeah, I'll be yes, delighted to be join. part of our conversation going forward. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Okay. Then, do you know for everyone who's still on how they can access Shanaz's recording when she has it done? Um, Shanaz, could you come on? If you can send it to me and I can send it out, or I don't think we have a mailing list of this whole group. Shanaz, are you still there? Ah, uh, yes, yes, I'm here. Um, I have no idea how that'll happen. <laughs> I mean, I'm still prepared to do it now, and you have this recording, so whoever stays, and then this is probably the best way, because it will be recorded in your system, and then you can, you can, you can share it from there. Um, what do you think? It doesn't matter if people leave. There's still 27 people here. Yeah. Um... I'm, I, I'm just no. I don't. I try to email the organisers if they're just going to kick us out or not. But maybe they shouldn't. Um, uh, what is the I feel? I think Zoom works that way. I think it ends only once you end. Well, the sometimes call. they cut you off. Sometimes they stay on. We've got 26 people left. How many people will will stay on? And the recording. I'm not recording it. Uh, CJ just recording it. Then they will get the whole recording in one piece and yours will be added may or may not be added to the end um so why don't we try starting quentin just to see so far okay i think convex support actually just came back on hi yes how are you good we were wondering um uh, Shanaz Munchi is one of our speakers who had an emergency earlier and wasn't able to um, give her talk um, and was wondering if we can go over by 20 minutes so that it's part of the recording for all the participants to receive later. Um, yeah, go ahead. Okay. All right. You see, it helps to challenge power. <laughs> all right, go ahead. Can you share your screen? Okay. So I usually start with a poem by Rebo Mashile. Um, I, I don't know if there's time for that. So yes, no, I will. Please Can do. I? Yeah. Okay. It's ready. So I just need to share the screen. Um, wait, give me a second now. We call on memories buried deep inside skeletons of the first people to walk the skin of the earth, who nursed and nested in the cradle and spread civilizations across the planet like seeds. Tell us of air that flows through the heart of the land to all life and creation. Tell us of breath, the first song. Tell us of words like constellations mapping our contributions to humanity. Tell us of infinity, how the universe lives in us. Tell us which stars bear our names so we no longer have to fear the night. Tell us of earth, of roots that course through the body of the land like veins through flesh. Tell us of the force that squeezed the red sand like dough to form mountains. Tell us how to build strong communities like gemstones forged under extreme pressure. 
We call on the desert to remember when she was the bottom of the sea. She leva se khodi sa malikane, mukibane wa munesa morale mwa na wa lepula na pula. So the poem ends, uh, but not in this recording. Tell us what we have forgotten. It, it's actually in here, I'm sure you can see. Tell us we are not afraid of bones. Tell us what we have lost. Tell us what we have lost. We are not afraid of remembering. Tell us what has been erased. We are not afraid of time. Tell us who we once were. We are not afraid of ourselves. We are not afraid of ourselves. We are not afraid of ourselves. Oh, that's powerful. I think this poem really resonates with the offering earlier on radical love or on love as a decolonial praxis. Um, and again, I reference a lot of feminist scholars who talk about radical self-care, um, reclaiming our ability to rest, to breathe, to care, to sit in conversation and to have meals together. Um, these are decolonial practices because we're often called to work um, like it's six o'clock tonight, you know, and we work till late and we work every hour and we fill our time with work um, and we don't often rest, even when trying to do decolonial work. So my talk is on critical perspectives on health, decolonial and intersectional framing to advance equity and justice. And the question that guides this lecture is what is global health, given the current context we've discussed on global inequality, sexism, racism, what do we want it to be? And how do historical perspectives in understanding public health, global health, or health medical humanities help us in developing decolonial and justice-driven responses that are relevant to specific contexts? So like many in the medical humanities, I start my uh, offering um, with a critical frame. And this critical frame is about recognizing that there is a relationship of power between the colonizer and the colonized. The colonizer is represented through systems, representations of people, places, hegemonic systems of dominance, subjugation, centers of power, health systems. Whereas the colonized are the communities, the cultures, beliefs, practices, people, subjectivities, land. And when you look at the pictures I've got on the right, you see my university, you see the University of Cape Town, and below it, the University of Cambridge. And all these universities have a similar look and feel because they embodied what a previous uh, person had mentioned, a similar cosmology, the, the philosophy. Um, um, I think, therefore I am. And this is grounded in a, a, a symmetry of the white man versus the other, as opposed to uh, Ubuntu, which is I think, therefore we are, which is a much more African philosophy. So this critical orientation seeks to understand these relationships of dominance and resistance within a framework that foregrounds power, politics, and positionality. And this reorientation centers the knowledge, the realities, and the people of the his, who are historically marginalized, um, and and to and to recognize their knowledge as valuable, legitimate um, knowledge bearers, and to use an intersectional lens. So I don't know how deep I need to go, so I'll I'll, I'll go quickly through these slides where I provide a definition, which is really to separate out. What is the historical moment of colonialism versus where we are today? And this historical moment, we recognize it as a powerful complex structure that, in, that is where the invention of this asymmetrical power relationship forms. Um, and it's not just about economic subjugation or dispossession. It is about social language in many other ways. But the interesting part is that it looks like a civilizing project like we see in this picture. Um, but it really, um, we need to think a bit deeper about who's foregrounded in this picture, 
who's in the background, who looks like knowledge holders, who are the recipients of care and knowledge, um, who belongs here, who is foreign, who, who lives here, why was this person injured? And the process of decolonization, which really describes the withdrawal. So again, a historic event that took place. But if you look at this, this, this um, image of the map of uh, the continent of Azania, um, language, the name Africa was imposed. The, the borders were imposed. And these borders remain. You know? So it's not really the, the myth of the decolonial, uh, of the post-colonial world is that the removal of colonial administration amounted to the evaporation of colonization. And actually, um, we continue to live under the same colonial matrix of power. And we need to start to be, develop a framework for that colonial matrix of power. And so decolonial scholars have coined the term coloniality to try to really um, capture this invisible power structure that sustains colonial relations of exploitation and domination. And it's, they call it coloniality as something that survived beyond colonization, but something that we breathe in and we look at and we see and we uh, surround us every day, at least living in our, our lungs, if we have to breathe in. And the image here, is about juxtaposing the first image I put of the man, the white man with the colonial outfit, healing a man in front of the village, in the village, to this woman, who is actually not in South Africa, but rather in the UK, in Rhodes University, that continues to feel silent, as those in the earlier image look silent in the background. Um, yet, this is an academic, a colleague, um, but in Rhodes University. So coloniality is this power relationship that's in, invisible, that's sustained, it continues. And so in order to try to get a grip of it, we need to begin in health and in the social sciences to think about our framework. And here I draw on a revision of the social determinants of health framework coming from the Pan-American Health Organization that recognizes um, that we recognize intersectionality as an important um, factor um, that uh, creates health inequities, but also that some of the structural drivers of health equity or inequity include a relationship to the land, structural racism, colonization. And the idea of recognizing that when you disrupt my relationship to my land, I, my health is affected. Um, and and, and that, is, that is an important consideration, especially for those communities like in South Africa, where perhaps I bury my umbilical cord of my baby into the land to signify home and birth and life and so on. In this uh, process, I draw um, intentionally on intersectional theory coming from Kimberly Crenshaw, but really recognizing the patterns of oppression being interrelated and the, and the intersecting and interlocking forms of power. And if I find myself being able to understand my unique circumstances of power, provision, identity, I am then able to look into from the purple inner circle to the pink inner circle to the orange outer circle to recognize what is my social class, indigeneity, experiences of racialization, my gender, and what are the oppressions that intersect and overpower on top of me, um, that, that um, uh, influence how I navigate, you know, and then to the outer layer of racism, discrimination, and so on. Critical race theory, as an important um, theory that, especially in the US, um, that was highlighted through the COVID-19 pandemic when the disproportionate burden shouldered by black and other racial minority groups was so profoundly evident that it couldn't be ignored. And so new emergent theories around critical race are emerging and we need to look to them to, to consider how do we move forward to a more um, 
uh, decolonial and um, a liberated space. Other approaches that we need to consider is alternative knowledge paradigms, which we spoke about in our small group as well. But here I, I call upon the, the indigenous, or I, I show um, the, or, um, the, the indigenous paradigms of the um, Aboriginal people, or at least one tribe, that really acknowledges the self, the spirit, the mind, the emotions. And then when you look at the outer circles, we see social and structural determinants of health. But the family, the extended family, the ancestors, the self, the community are central to this idea of how do we achieve um, community health? How do we achieve community-oriented primary health? How do we achieve public health? How do we achieve health? So with that in mind, um, we, we, we then, I then present a terminology of decoloniality. Because if we, 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 we define coloniality, what is decoloniality? And decoloniality is a type of decolonization that advocates for this disruption of coloniality, of the race, gender, geopolitical inequality. It's a liberation project, an economic, epistemological liberation project to dismantle and dislodge um, coloniality, to center indigenous voices, to begin the process of delinking from the matrix of power, to disrupt, disentangle, and to start liberating. We do not want to live in a deficit model. And the images I have here is of women on the top who are um, standing outside uh, one of the embassies, I think in Johannesburg, um, asking for vaccines, you know, because Black Lives Matter even in South Africa, where we have a black majority, but the minority white community still con uh, maintain control over the businesses, um, over education, and over many sectors in South African society. And to recognize that, that the Western Sahara is continuously um, still colonized by Morocco today. And we need to move to a decolonization and, and, and decoloniality. So, so going back to the colonial matrix of power, what do we need to dismantle? And here I would like to bring in the organizing principles that decolonial scholars have, have taught us of coloniality of power, knowledge, and being. And if we are to try to dismantle these, we, we, we may be able to um, move, move away to, towards a liberation space. So what is coloniality of power? This is about, refers to the asymmetrical power relation. It's the technologies used to dominate, to control, to exploit. It's the structural processes within the global imperial design that maintains superiority of the North and maintains inferiority of the South. So here in this image, we see some, uh, again, um, activists in South Africa, in Johannesburg, outside the French embassy, um, confronting power, knowing that they um, their letter of, uh, will not be, their doors will not, of the embassy will not be open. Um, that, and, and, and here it's a matrix of pharmaceutical companies, of um, French, uh, or, or, of Northern colonialism, uh, and many other forms of power that we see in business and so, and, and so on. So Ramon Grossfugel identified nine types of, of, of exploitation and control. And the ones that are, are, are top of mind in South Africa, especially or in countries affected by racism, is racism, capitalism, and heteropatriarchy. And because we are in a, not in a university, epistemic and knowledge is also an important one, or even linguistic. These principles inform a decolonial framework, and they help us to, to, to disrupt the idea of colonization. So we need to know as we sit in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a university, what is coloniality of knowledge? And it is the processes of domination of knowledge. And here, like Lebo Mashile, we need to call on history. We need to remember the moments when the history, the libraries um, of, of Andalusia and the libraries of Rwanda and the libraries were destroyed, even of the people, um, of, of, of the Scottish people in the Highlanders that we mentioned earlier. Were, were, were killed and the witches or the witches of the Highlands were killed um, because uh, to be replaced um, by dominant forms of knowledge. 
Um, and, and that dominant knowledge is now considered a legitimate way of knowing the world. Um, and then being, the coloniality of being is about what we mentioned earlier, the denial of humanity, the process of inferiorization, of the othering of the colonized people in relation to the white subject. And here we see that there are many movements across the world that have recognized that they, are, they want um, out of the um, denial and that they want to reclaim their lives because black lives matter, because um, other forms of, of, of neo forms of colonialism and Hindu extremism in India is not going to be accepted um, because Africans in South Africa can, it's not going to be accepted for, for, for a South African to be xenophobic to other Africans. It's not going to be acceptable for indigenous people's lives to be um, uh, ignored, or or land uh, um, to be or, and land where there is um, oil or other forms of um, mineral welfare to be extracted. Extractivism, um, it's no longer going to be acceptable. And and here's the quote I mentioned earlier around the the colonization of the mind being the worst form of colonization because um, it is our consciousness and our identity um, that is shaped and shifted um, and, and becomes a, a way that the oppressor can control us. So I wanted to give an example of coloniality being instrumentalized in the sexual reproductive and um, health sector, you know, so that we can try and bring these things together a little. And if you look back to history, like Lebo asked us to call history, the global gag rule is a form of power where money and finances and political control is instrumentalized. No, um, Shanaz, um, I've just been informed we have to end at 12.30. So I think you have three or four minutes, unfortunately. I think I have only about a few more slides. Okay, thank you. So I won't give the other examples, but I'm going to give an example of knowledge where we look at race-based science or the process of eugenics as his historical forms of power and the coloniality of being where it's experienced as forced sterilizations or coercive practices or the criminalization of sex work, workers in South Africa. So how do we move from theory to practice? What do we do? And I think this is a space for us to, to, to bring history to the, to the front, to develop an understanding um, in a webinar like this, that there's no magical silver bullet, but we need to dismantle the system and structures of power. We need to politicize our research. We need to see what we do as a tool for social justice. Um, we need to ask how does the past live in the present. And we need to then act to disrupt the interlocking forces of power, inequality, and social gradients. So we need to ask, I need to ask myself, what does disruption of the matrix of power mean for me? In what way? And how do I move away from thinking as a researcher or an activist or an advocate that I'm out to save the private community, but instead to see that, um, people have agency and I need to recognize their humanity. And how do we go through this process of deep internal reflexivity to question who I am, how, what I'm doing, and how am I complicit in the colonial project? How am I doing exactly what's happening in this picture, but in a different way? It looks different, but it's the same thing. And so uh, decolonial scholars, Shose Kesi and Floretta Bunzaya, uh, wrote a chapter in a book called Resistance and Transformation in Postcolonial Context. And they said researchers cannot deliver the solution to the, uh, to the problems of the oppressed, but they can assist people in the process of achieving the change they seek. Community partners in marginal communities are the experts of their own lives and knowledgeable, most knowledgeable about the challenges they face and the aspects of their lives they need to change. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Quentin, I think you're muted right now. 
Sorry, thank you so much, Anas, for that. I'm glad we could still do this. And sorry if we had to chase you through it, but um, good thing we could still do it. So we're going to be kicked out of here in a minute. Um, but I do want to encourage everyone to, to join the Global Health Humanities Working Group. There's a very rich discussion going on. And I put my email in there. Shanaz, can you give us the name of that poet in the, in the chat? I was so impressed with that poem. It was beautiful. Is she, uh, she's South African? I don't know her. The poet? Yeah. Oh. I think Giamma also asked for your contact, Shanaz, if that's okay. What? Yes, yes, yes. I will put my email address. And yes, Lebo, Lebo Khang Mashile is South African. And the whole full poem is actually on Facebook. So I'm just going to send the link. Send the link. Um, yeah, there's there's yeah. some really powerful poetry and art and all of that, uh, that, that really, I think, some really more interesting ideas in the art than in the academic space on decoloniality. Oh, yeah. yeah please, please put it there if you can. Um, uh, so, um, you know, um, we've got to go from here. There's a lot to think about, a lot to write. I think we should have more webinars on, on this topic at CUGH. We've had a couple. Um, we should go ahead with this. Uh, these are such rich discussions. I've said many times at CUJH, you cannot talk about this whole decolonization debate without involving the humanities. And uh, to be to be honest, I get blank stares many times from, from people because um, epidemiologists and infectious disease doctors are not the ones fully qualified. Maybe they can do some of the structural decolonization, but not, not the real fundamental decolonization. Um, any uh, Revathy, Rose, who else, Ajioma, any comments or anybody else? No, just very grateful. I'm so glad that we decided to listen to that last part. I thought that was a wonderful way by Shanaz to end this conversation and conclude. And I agree that we need frequent webinars such as this just throughout the year, maybe quarterly or something, where a small group of us can come together and really massage this. Um, we, this is not, um, you know, hypertension. The definition of hypertension is 140 over 80, the end. This needs a lot of, you know, just really conversation, really unpacking in uh, something like we would say in Nigeria we need to chop the matter we have to chop it you know and to really understand and get into the heart and soul of it so thank you again to this was an outstanding conference i had a whole meeting that i just decided not to attend because this i believe is more valuable than talking about um whether or not we have uh, made our RVUs this month. RVUs, for those who are not physicians, are basically what they call the income that we generate by seeing patients. That's another conversation instead of capitalism, Shanaz, right? So in any event, thank you again for this. And I look forward to our next um, hopeful uh, conversation, hopefully in a couple of months, but not longer than that. Yeah. Shanaz, that was really an incredibly elegant and condensed um, and wonderfully accessible presentation of colonization and decolonization. And yeah, it was lovely. Just lovely. Tenders. I'll add that I, I'm also a huge fan girl now of you, Shanaz. And I think each one of your slides could be an entire amazing journal club just from the beginning. And when I was like this feminist humanities that is encouraging rest, I mean, where has that been in all of academic? So this is amazing. And I, I hope that we can explore each and every one of the things that you talked about in the coming um, weeks, months, years. Thank you. So please put, I don't see the poet's name yet. Send it to me. Um, and Patrick, uh -huh. thank you again so much. A, a brilliant talk as well. Um, we could carry on for some for hours. And um, But um, please uh, consider joining the Global Health Humanities Group. I've said many times we need people from outside the United States. Anva, did you want to say something? Yeah, uh, Shinas, that was excellent uh, whole presentation, the whole talk, the ideas. And I really like to thank you from the bottom of my heart. And